So most of you are probably familiar with psychopathy or psychopathic personality and what those traits are. But look, as a quick recap, if we, if we break it down, we're really talking about a combination of features that come together and it's that presentation of these features that really creates this toxic and problematic cocktail of, of a personality. So, you know, we're really talking about these individuals that are ruthless, they're manipulative, they're very grandiose, they're, they're prone and skilled at lying, but they're also very fearless and daring. So they're not afraid to take risks and they don't get burdened by anxiety. They're not burdened by the typical emotional processes that might stop or inhibit us. And I'll touch a little bit more on that shortly. And they really need excitement. They like to be challenged and they like to take risks. At the same time though, they're also very goal driven and instrumentally oriented. They like to pursue things that are in their interests, that are to their benefit and ultimately that are all about them. So we're talking about, of course, a personality though that is on a spectrum. It's on a continuum. So we have the everyday person, which is right down at the end that may have a couple of these traits and then we dial up the dials and as we move up that spectrum and the more traits that are present, certainly the more likely we would say someone is psychopathic. And of course, the more concerning that would be for that individual to then enter into the organization. And one of the big factors that is often quite interesting when we think about psychopaths in the workplace is their remarkable ability to create polarization. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about basically dividing individuals within the workplace. We have those that love them and those that hate them. And always when we see polarization in the workplace, it's really interesting to dig deep and try and understand it further. Because ultimately we're not talking about individuals though that are there for the organisational benefit. It's all about them. And when we think about what that means, that really raises the question around, are they going to be then successful for the business or destructive? So what motivates them? What makes these individuals want to take these positions and enter into the organisation? Well, when we get to the bottom of it and we talk about what motivates them, we're really talking about a desire for power, a desire for success, the financial profit, and of course, the challenge aspect as well is also a really significant motive, motive for these fellows. So they like to be challenged. They like to dominate others. And the opportunity to play in a high stakes situation and to use cheating and manipulative strategies along with lying and a variety of other deceptive practices really is in, in many ways a perfect opportunity if they get through the door. And when we look at things from a social harm perspective, you know, we're really talking about traits that can cause widespread harm within an organization and widespread disruption. And then of course, there are also traits that can of course, ultimately lead to the, the downfall of an organization if things go uh, completely sideways. And we've seen that with organizations such as Enron. So, are there adaptive benefits? Is there a benefit to bringing in a psychopathic person into an organization? Well, it really depends on what those adaptive benefits are compared to the myriad of consequences that could arise. So as we work our way through the presentation, we'll talk about what those consequences are and really look what at what is at stake for an organization. So how do we get psychopathic fellows into the organizations? Now, the obvious answer is that the traits often allow for someone to dupe and fool and work their way into an organization because we all know that psychopathic individuals make very powerful and very pertinent first impressions. They, as, as the saying goes, they can certainly talk the walk. But there's also 
some interesting theoretical perspectives which explain why we may get a violent psychopath and why we may get an individual that's able to tailor their traits, features such as impulsivity or moderate features such as impulsivity, to function to a degree successfully within an organisation and then often take what they want and then move on to the next business. So we've got three really interesting perspectives. Now, the first one is this idea of a subclinical type of psychopath. So ultimately talking about a form of the disorder where the traits are just slightly dialed back. We, we might be dealing with people that are more aberrant self-promoters. They may be very grandiose and bold and they may lack a bit of empathy, but they're just that step back along the spectrum and therefore there's enough there to allow the person to function even though they may cause some chaos and destruction. Then we have what we term as the moderated pathway. So there's various factors that may moderate the traits that the person develops. And there could be a protective factor such as having a good education, a good socioeconomic upbringing, support, a supportive family or certain opportunities. And those factors may soften or moderate the psychopathic traits so that they become expressed in more pro-social outlets. So that might be things such as risk taking through racing cars, racing motorbikes, skydiving, sexual promiscuity, but having the awareness and the understanding to act out in a way that's more pro-social rather than antisocial. And on the polar to that though, we may see people that have difficult upbringings or trauma and they may be introduced to drugs and violence early and that therefore may then in some aspects through that socialization and through that environmental exposure lead them more into a pathway where they're more likely to go towards antisociality and violence. And then lastly we have what's known as the dual or multi-process developmental way of psychopathy and it's really saying that successful traits may develop through different etiological pathways. So different developmental pathways and different traits develop through different processes. So features such as a lack of empathy or being grandiose and self-centered may develop through certain mechanisms, whereas antisocial and aggressive tendencies may develop through other etiological processes or underlying mechanisms. So essentially we're saying that different aspects give rise to different traits.